Okay, let's get started. I want to welcome everyone to our third and final uh, webinar uh, as part of the Washington Conference webinar series. Uh, excited about today. Uh, we're really going to try to dive deep into kind of the schedule, uh, the virtual uh, uh, congressional meetings, and also some of the issues. I'm also happy to be joined by Molly Van Lu and John Holly, colleagues of mine on the government relations count or government relations team at United Fresh. So, uh, welcome Molly and John as well to the to the webinar today. Uh, before we get started, uh, I got a short video I want to play for you to kind of get everybody excited and ready to go for today and and the Washington conference in a couple of weeks. me the best word that describes the Washington conference is must see. It's change. Impactful. All right. So ready, set, go. Uh, we're ready for today's webinar and um, happy that all of you could join us today. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, really we're going to focus on four major things today uh, before we get into the question discussion section. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the schedule and how to navigate the Washington Conference Week. Uh, then we're going to get into some more details about the virtual March on Capitol Hill, you know, some more of the details. Some of you who were on last week uh, saw a, a quick, uh, uh, quick Snapchat snap of, of that uh, event. Uh, then uh, we're going to dive deeper into kind of the, the congressional schedule, uh, what it's going to look like. And then finally, uh, what's at stake? Uh, John and Molly are gonna walk us through uh, some of the issues we're dealing with in more detail in, in our 2020 policy priorities uh, for the Washington Conference. And then finally, we'll stop, we'll, we'll finish it up with a question and discussion uh, section. Uh, as again, as um, if you have questions, uh, you wanna ask the group, uh, as myself, Molly or John, please use your question uh, section in, in, the, in, the, um, in the webinar. And uh, we'll get to those questions uh, near the end of the end of the session. So to kind of start, I wanted to share with you a little bit of what the what the schedule is going to look like. And again, this is very traditional of what we've done in, in when everybody's here in person. Uh, we really start on it's a Monday through Thursday format, uh, where Monday we will be doing our expert council meetings. And just as a reminder, if you don't know this already, but those who are registered for the conference can participate in these council and board in market segment board meetings on Monday um, uh, during, during, the, during the morning session and, and through, through uh, the afternoon. So you are allowed to attend those meetings. You have to be registered to attend. Uh, and uh, so you can learn kind of from different councils and boards what they're, what they're talking about, what issues are important, and some of the um, uh, back and forth that we have in those important meetings uh, that we have on Monday. Uh, that evening, we have a volunteer leader uh, networking event uh, that is going to be hosted by the United Fresh Government Relations Council. So we're excited at that point where we'll get all the different councils and board members together to kind of share uh, information, share discussions about what, what's in, what, what they were talking about and kind of other questions that may come up. Then Tuesday is really when we kick off our, our session, uh, our regular Washington Conference planning, general sessions and education. Uh, we, have, we will have an opening session where we've invited Secretary uh, of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, to participate. We have two, two education sessions uh, advocating in a virtual environment. And then uh, also work, uh, a, a education session related to how other sectors of the food industry, so the dairy industry, the meat and poultry industry, seafood industry, how are they been dealing with, the, with, with managing the COVID in their, in their environment? So I think that'll be very engaging and interesting discussion that we'll have. Again, that night we'll have another networking session. This is for writing, rising leaders. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what they're doing as a role to be active in the government relations policy sector. Uh, what are they doing in their local communities? Really as rising leaders kind of, kind of engaging uh, with each other to, to share knowledge, share information about this year and in going into the November 3rd elections. Then Tuesday, uh, we will have a election 2020 live general session. A lot of Wednesday will be focused on, on the election uh, um, coming up in the presidential and congressional elections, where we've invited um, uh, 
surrogates from uh, Joe, the Joe Biden campaign, Vice President Biden campaign, and President Trump's campaign. Uh, I can tell you we have confirmed um, uh, the Vice President Biden's uh, person who will be joining us, and hopefully in the next couple of days we'll be confirming uh, President Trump's uh, person who will be joining us. So again, that will be a very interesting session to learn about what they will be working on past the election, should should win one of them are elected uh, elected president. Um, we also will be joined by Frank Luntz, a political an analyst. Uh, he has joined us several times during the Washington conference and always has very interesting insight in how the, both the presidential and congressional elections are playing out across, across the country. And again, then we shift into uh, two more education sessions that day, uh, talking about nutrition programs where Molly can share a little bit of, of what we'll be talking about today. Um, and then also uh, John can share a little bit about the workforce challenges uh, in, co in the COVID-19 environment. So as you know, there's been a lot of issues, a lot of challenges related to protecting employees, uh, a lot of good things that are happening in the industry related to, to protecting their employees uh, during this trying time. Uh, John and, and the panel will be having a lot of discussion about that. Then finally that night, our last networking session of the Washington Conference will be an election night celebration. Uh, we plan to have a lot of fun, a lot of different polls to talk about, um, you know, to kind of uh, interact with. We'll break up into small discussion rooms and chats, uh, but it should be a really fun, exciting thing that we're time we're going to do for that election night celebration. Finally, Thursday wraps up the, um, the, the, the normal general sessions in education. Uh, we'll be doing a bipartisan panel. Uh, with Congressman Rodney Davis from Illinois and Congressman Jimmy Panetta from California to talk about how they are engaging in this new COVID environment uh, as members of Congress from two different, from Republican and Democratic parties uh, with together, uh, working together as they have done on a lot of different issues, but also with their other colleagues uh, in the House and the Senate. Also, we'll learn probably some up-to-date information during that during that time about what's happening on the negotiations with the multiple things that, that, that Congress has to get done before they before the end of September and before they go home for their elections. And then we'll round out our final uh, day of education or our fifth and sixth education sessions. We'll look at some international response to the outbreak. So what is happening in other countries? What are they doing to respond to COVID related to the food industry? How are they working with their import and exports, but also internally with the food industry? What are they doing in these in countries? And then also we're gonna be joined by uh, FDA and Frank Giannis is joining us for our third panel to focus on food safety and the partnership what FDA has had with, with the industry. So Monday through Wednesday, excuse me, Monday through Thursday are gonna be very exciting, a lot of good information to get you ready for the congressional meetings. So as we've, talked about before, uh, actually our congressional meetings are over about a six day period. Uh, we start them actually on Thursday uh, of, of after the, after the, wash, after the uh, education general sessions have, start, have, have concluded. Um, most of you know this is more on the left hand side, our traditional way we've done congressional meetings. The, the, the picture above is really what it's going to look like when we're doing our congressional meetings. Several members of Congress, uh, a member of Congress, their staff, all of us as, as attendees. Uh, this will be something unique, but a, but a very, I think, a very unique opportunity related to how we're going to be interacting with Congress over, over a six-day period. Um, so in terms of, of the meetings, you know, as I, I've mentioned before, this, I think this is a very unique opportunity. Not only will you be able to visit with your members of Congress and senators, but you'll also be able to participate in RSVP for additional meetings with other colleagues, with other members, with, with other colleagues across the country, and also get exposed and have discussions with other members of Congress and senators from different regions, uh, different political uh, alignments uh, in different parts of the country uh, as, you, as you sign up for these meetings. As I mentioned, uh, the meetings will be spread out over six days. Uh, we're not going to cram them into two afternoons like we traditionally do. So this will hopefully be able to you to plan around your normal work schedule so you can attend uh, or participate in several meetings a day or, or you know, that, 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 would, that might be interesting to, interesting to you. Uh, I think the quality of visits are going to be much better. Uh, mainly because I think we've gotten, for the most part, mostly our meetings because of the virtual uh, nature of them, uh, actual member meetings, uh, not just staff. Uh, and then another thing uh, that we've added to the congressional timeframe 
is the is having several administration and embassy visits that will be weaved into that six day period. So on top of the congressional meetings, we are working to, to secure meetings with different administration officials from different agencies and, and departments across the administration, but also several different embassies who, are, who would, are interested in talking with our members about what's happening in their countries and, and, and vice versa. Um, it will be a unique, and I'll get into this in a second, kind of uh, format. Uh, it, we do plan to allow interaction with those who are attending these meetings. Um, and having a, a Q&A with each of the members of Congress that we, um, that we, that we have uh, signed up for meetings. The important thing to know is to participate in these meetings, you have to be registered for the Washington Conference to participate. Uh, until you register uh, for the Washington Conference, you will not get an RSVP uh, to, to sign up for these, these meetings. So what do these meetings look like? Uh, this is a sample of what the, uh, the, the registration page or the, uh, the schedule page of the congressional business looks like. Um, so I think this is important to look at as we will have a list of each day of time and, 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 and who we're meeting with on each day. So if you're interested in these meetings, some of these will be easy for you to say, oh, I definitely want to go to that meeting. But there will be some cases where you're not sure why we're meeting with that senator or who, who we're meeting with. So that allows you to view their profile. And once you link this on, you can go onto a member's profile. This is an example of Dan Newhouse's profile on the, on the right. Uh, it shares a lot of different information with you. And one of the key things we're adding, these are very unique to United Fresh, to our industry, of what the information we're sharing with you as part of these member and senator profiles. Mainly key votes uh, that they have taken over the last couple of years. Uh, this will show you some of the bills we have tracked, some of the bills we've supported and not supported. Uh, so to speak, on, on, on votes. And this shows how the members of Congress voted on those bills. We also have included uh, bills that have been sponsored uh, that we think are important in the House and Senate, that we think are important and that we would like these members to sponsor um, as or co-sponsor as, as, as we talk to them during these visits. So some unique information there. As always, we've also included the, the state profiles of, of the meetings, excuse me, the state profiles of, of uh, uh, fruit and vegetable profiles of each state. Again, this is valuable information to, to work on before you get to, to uh, excuse me, before you participate in the Washington meetings and in the virtual meetings on Capitol Hill. Uh, this is, again, some good information to share, to have and look at. So, when I mentioned like you have to register to attend the meeting, this is the page you will get. So basically, once you register for a meeting, you will also get a link that will show you not just a profile, but a way to RSVP for these meetings. So again, this kind of gives you another view of this. So right now, you can go on if you're not an attendee or not registered to attend. You can go on and look at these profiles and look at the different meetings that we have thus far. And Believe me, we're adding meetings every week. Uh, we, we hope to have over 50 to 60 different meetings uh, for the Washington Conference, if not more, uh, by the time we get to our, our virtual March on Capitol Hill. Uh, but this, as you register, you will get a link, then you can RSVP for this, uh, multiple meetings or just one meeting, uh, depending on how your schedule works and what you're interested in. So I mentioned the state profiles. Uh, again, this is important information that we've, we've always had uh, for our attendees. A lot of times we give this out to the members of Congress, and I know as we do more traditional Washington Conference uh, marches on Capitol Hill, uh, we've, we've had these as, as information for our members. The other is our issue brief that I'll share with you in just a minute. Um, this really is your one-stop shop for talking about the issues or looking or digging deeper into the issues that we're going to be talking about when we're, when we're having these meetings. And again, Molly and John are gonna get deeper into these issues beyond what's on this paper, but this is another important link that, that we think is important to have, uh, important information that you should be looking at prior to coming to, or prior to, prior to participating in the Washington Conference. So what I'm gonna do now is go live uh, into the, um, give me a second into the uh, Washington Conference site. Can you guys see that now? Molly and John, can you shake your, shake your head? Can you see the, the Washington Conference site? So as I mentioned, uh, this is kind of our main page of the Washington Conference. Uh, several things, you can register, you can view the schedule. Uh, but the two things I wanted to mention are first, the virtual March on Capitol Hill. 
And once you once you get get into this site, this will drag this will bring you to the the different meetings that we have uh, already posted already. As I mentioned, um, this is um, a, a list as of today. Uh, we will be adding to this list. Uh, at the bottom, you will see meetings that we have confirmed, but they have still not confirmed the date and time. So we have several meetings in that space and then we'll be continuing to add to that. But you can see already, we have a very robust list of, of members and senators that we're gonna be meeting with. And again, as I mentioned, you can go right, on to, right into their profiles. So let's go and look at Senator Patty Murray from, from Washington State. You click that on, uh, this is gonna pull up her um, her profile, and again, as I mentioned, it has really good information about that senator, about bills that we support, that, that figuring out how they voted on it, but also bills that we think are important uh, to co-sponsor and, and if they've co-sponsored it or not. It also gives you a brief profile, some state information about the, 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 the state and the agriculture interest in those states, but again, really shares with you some good information to learn about members that you or senators you may not be familiar with, but also you want to, um, uh, but you may want to participate in those meetings uh, when, when, when we have them scheduled. So what I'm gonna do now then is that, then I'm gonna go also to the issue brief. Again, this is another link. Um, once you click this on, this will give you a very full description, uh, robust discussion of all the issues that we're gonna be talking about uh, during our Washington conference. And I, I, as some of you know, who have been on the webinars, the first two webinars, I have touched on a lot of these, a lot of these issues, but this is really your headquarters for really di diving deeper where you want to on, on a lot of these issues. For instance, um, I can talk about the current programs that are in place. Uh, we can look, you know, kind of click this on. This sends you directly to the coronavirus um, page that allows you to look at uh, different things that are going on with uh, the, the, the coronavirus food assistance program at USDA. Uh, applications, you can click on specialty crops and learn more about that. Uh, also, you can look at the dashboard, uh, which shows you kind of up to date uh, what's happening uh, in, the, in every state about monies that have been distributed uh, throughout the different areas. So for instance, for specialty crops, uh, there's been about 11,335 applications approved and over a half a billion dollars of funding that has gone into the CFAT program for fruit and vegetable and other specialty crop commodities uh, throughout the country. So this gives you a quick, brief, you know, kind of understanding of, of the information that's in there. Uh, again, if you go back here and we wanna talk about a bill that you're interested in, um, the Food Supply Protection Act, for instance, Senator Stabenow's bill. You can click that on. Uh, that gives you a really robust uh, information from, from the Senate Ag Committee staff, uh, uh, um, excuse me, uh, website, more details about the bill and exactly what it does and who the co-sponsors are, some different quotes from folks who are supporting the bill uh, and, and, and others. So we're really happy about this interactive issue brief. Uh, instead of having it in hand, so to speak, when you get here, as you know, you're familiar with, we usually put that in your binder. Uh, this will be very interactive for you to learn as much as you want about our issues. What are the key talking points? As you mentioned, as I mentioned here, we have key talking points on each of these sections, um, but really some, a really robust set of information that you, you can use as you get ready for the Washington Conference. So I'll stop sharing that and go back to uh, the slides, let's see here, uh, where is it? Let me see what, it, sorry about this guys, let me get this right. Okay, you got that? All right, great. So, a couple of things, key steps. So for your, for your um, uh, virtual march on Capitol Hill, First, as I mentioned, register for the Washington Conference. After that, you will receive a link to the virtual March page, which will then allow you to RSVP for one or more meetings uh, during, during those six days. Uh, recommend that you review the meetings and congressional profiles, as I mentioned, especially for those who you might be interested in, in, in joining a meeting, but you're not sure uh, about that member or that senator. Uh, as I mentioned, just then you wanna choose the meetings you will sign up for. 
Uh, as we get closer to that meeting and to the Washington conference, you will re be receiving a unique log Zoom login for that particular meeting with information about times and things like that. And then, as I mentioned, review the issue briefs and start preparing questions and some talking points you may want to share with that member or senator. So moving forward into kind of an example of what a meeting would look like, uh, our, the way we are going to be setting the meetings up in this virtual format is there will be a meeting leader for each meeting who will welcome and introduce the member of Congress or Senator, as well as the guests who are there. Uh, we will then probably most likely have remarks from the, by the member of Congress or Senator. Um, then at that point, uh, we will have a, a brief discussion on some of the issues that are important to us. So what are our key talking points? Some of this will be driven by the leader, but a lot of it will be driven by the constituents uh, in those meetings. Uh, they will get first shot, so to speak, or first chance to, to really talk with the, with the member or senator about the issues that are important. Uh, we will have to give some interaction with questions and discussions. Then we'll open it up for questions from all participants. Uh, again, we'll be using the similar format we're using today where you can type in your questions and then there will be somebody who will moderate those questions and, and be able to ask them as, as time uh, allows us. And then obviously at the end, we'll thank, thank them in conclusions. Uh, they will have a list of our issues as well uh, and the issues we're focusing on. So they'll be hopefully be well prepared for the for the meeting and be able to be briefed on that by their staff. There will be exam sam examples of where there will be staff only. We are trying as much as we right now we have um, almost over 95, 96% of our meetings right now are member meetings. Uh, as we get closer to the time, if there is a change in that meeting, we will let you know that that's a staff meeting versus a member meeting. So they may impact your decision to whether to join or not. So that's a real quick overview of the schedule and the meetings. Now we're going to really turn it over to what our policy priorities are and what's at stake. And again, as many as you mentioned, uh, many of you may have seen it last week, there's really three big asks three big buckets that I called it last week of things we are focusing on. There's current programs that have been helpful during the stimulus package. Uh, there are new programs, new legislation out there that we'd like to see included in a new COVID package. And then finally, it's gonna be important for us to have to tell your story about things that are working and things that are not working and why it's important to continue support during this very challenging time related to COVID uh, that we must face. And before I kind of get into the details and I'll introduce Molly and John, uh, really, uh, you know, kind of this framework of, of what we're seeing kind of shaping up in September is once they get back in, in the next couple of weeks is really focusing on two things, really focusing on a new COVID package, support package, a stimulus package that was, was introduced by both the House and the Senate, or, um, passed by the House, the House version was passed, the HEROES Act, uh, but the but the Senate bill has only been introduced. But they are really working, you know, the, the, what they will be focusing on a lot is the administration, House and Senate, Republicans and Democrats working to come together with a compromise, a, a consensus piece of legislation that will be the fourth and most likely the final COVID package that we will see this year and, and even into next year. Uh, they also will be working on keeping the government running. As you know, September 30th is the, the end of the fiscal year for the federal government. And as some of you um, uh, folks who have been to past Washington conference, we have actually been in the middle of some of this where the uh, government has shut down in the middle of our conference. Uh, so they will also be negotiating either a comprehensive uh, bill, but most likely a continuing, uh, a bill that continues to fund the government. And that has to be done by the end of September as well, or the government will be shut down. So these two, two issues are, are, are gonna be front and center throughout September. Uh, it, there's a lot of speculation right now that, that they may collide into having bit one big bill that keeps the government going. Also, um, you know, uh, has a COVID stimulus package attached, kind of a once one package that would be done before the end of September. So again, as I mentioned before, uh, in other w webinars, and we've, we've shared with you in emails and stuff, this is going to be a critical time to be in, to be talking with, with our members of Congress and the administration in Washington as they are discussing and debating and negotiating these, these important parts uh, of their, of their uh, legislative and, and administrative agenda. So real three big asks, as I mentioned, what is kind of, you know, the existing COVID programs, broadening assistance for fresh produce industry, and then telling your story. 
So again, I've shared this uh, several times now. Uh, when you look at the really the current COVID programs that are in place, there's really four or five key programs that we have focused most of our time on. The Paycheck Protection Program, uh, which has uh, uh, provided the industry around $2.7 billion in funding. Um, that has been an important lifeline to keep, keep uh, folks employed, but also paying some bills to keep them afloat. The, the Coronavirus uh, Food Assistance Program run by USDA, that is the direct payment program for, for growers and grower shippers. Uh, it's actually, that, that number is a little old, as I showed you in the chart. It's about a little over 500, uh, almost a half, over a half a billion dollars now in funding that has gone out to our industry uh, around that program. The Farms to Family program, again, those are the food box programs, about 1.7 billion has been focused on that program uh, directly to the fresh produce industry by delivering fresh produce to uh, those most in need through food feeding uh, sites uh, and other uh, food bank institutions. Uh, it's been a very successful program. Uh, it hasn't come without some controversy, uh, but certainly it is, is a program that has been very helpful in our industry throughout the entire supply chain. And then finally, some of the nutrition programs that Molly's gonna talk about, around $250 million has been part of that. So our key messages during that time is really, these have been valuable tools, and some of these need to be, or these have to be maintained and enhanced. And again, John and Molly talk a little bit about that um, in a few minutes, about what we're talking about related to enhancing these programs. Uh, as you know, and so, but we, the main, main issue here is we wanna continue these programs during the next COVID bill. And, 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 and make sure that they are uh, maintained and continue to thrive as, as they have already. Second message point is broadening assistance for the fresh produce industry. And again, Molly and John are gonna be talking about this related to nutrition programs, liability protection, more funding for PPE um, uh, equipment, uh, things like that, uh, tax credits, things like that, we, we want to see that bills have been introduced that we support, but we'd like to see them in part them or parts of them in the final package or final COVID-4 bill that is willingly negotiated in September. So while current programs have benefited our industry, uh, more needs to be done. And as I mentioned, uh, food service, uh, essential employees, uh, families and children, all are gonna be important. Bills that we're gonna be talking about that Molly and John are gonna be talking about in a few minutes are all very important to us to continue to support and try to get in this final package. And lastly, tell your story. Uh, it's gonna be important to share positive examples uh, of how current programs have helped, but also talk about the pain that is still out there. What is happening in your companies, in your operations that needs more help? Some of these things that we think uh, should be included in the bill, or included in a, in a COVID package, really need to be focused on uh, and, and explain in, in really real terms of why, um, why, why these programs would help uh, alleviate some of the challenges that you may be facing in your business and your operations. Again, we always say this every year. Uh, it's just as important this year as it has been in years in the past. We can talk about the technical issues and the policies and what the support, but having you on, on these calls, on these virtual meetings, in these congressional meetings, telling your story is the critical component that we need to get us over the finish line to be successful in a, in a COVID-4 package. And so think about that between now and when, we when, you, when you sign up for your meetings of what are, those, what are those stories that you can tell, what are those examples you can give uh, that will help deliver our strong message and make it stronger for those members of Congress. Because they remember that more than they remember myself Molly and John, you know, coming up there talking with their teams, you know, a lot every day or right now, you know, in virtual meetings. So those stories really have a long term impact of support for the things that we we want to we want to see move forward. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce Molly, John Holly, our senior director of government relations and Molly Van, Van Lu, our senior director for nutrition to kind of share with us uh, some more details about these policies and what's important. So John, I think you, you're up first, so welcome. And um, I will um, do the slides as we, uh, if you want me to do the slides, I can do those um, as, as, as we go forward. Yeah, that's great. And thank you, Robert. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, wanna give a kind of quick overview of some of the program, programs that Robert described a little bit about that uh, we are maintaining support for. 
um, because they've been so helpful during the COVID-19 process. And then also talk a little bit about supporting some of the new programs and our legislative priorities uh, that you all are gonna be talking about on Capitol Hill. So why don't we get to the first slide and we'll start talking about some of the current programs. Uh, so many of you are probably familiar with the Commodity Food Assistance Program, or uh, as it's known as CFAP. Um, you know, we, we always love uh, to use uh, terms like that here in Washington, D.C. We always have something uh, to call a program to shorten it. Um, but CFAP has been, uh, as Robert has said, uh, a huge uh, benefit to our industry. So as it says here, uh, you can see the program has been uh, beneficial to our industry with over 13,000 fruit and vegetable growers benefiting from over $400 million, and those dollars continue to increase uh, by the day. Um, and it's been a direct payment program, which is probably new for some of you in the fruit and vegetable industry. Um, and so that has been somewhat of a challenge, but I think a great opportunity for a lot of us. We are looking to continue that program. And the Senate has proposed a secondary loan program for growers to continue to provide support. We also think that there is support within the House uh, as well. So as they negotiate um, either the next COVID-4 uh, package uh, or something in addition to the appropriations bill that Robert also mentioned, that's something that will definitely be uh, on our minds. The next program uh, that has been extremely helpful to our industry is the Paycheck Protection Program. And this is something that's helped all kinds of businesses, but has been specifically helpful to over 3,000 produce businesses, which have received over $2.7 billion in support through the program. Uh, both in the House and the Senate want to continue this support in some form or fashion, but as everything goes in Washington, it is a negotiation. But this is something that has been a lifeline uh, to businesses of all kinds, including those in the produce industry. Robert. Um, now, so we have helpful programs that are out there already, but um, in working with our colleagues in the House and Senate, uh, or our friends, I should say, in the House and Senate, we've also pushed uh, for a number of additional programs to provide support for the industry. Probably first and first, or first and first, um, first and first among those has been the Food Supply Protection Act. And as you all know that Senator Debbie Stabenow, who's the ranking member of Agriculture Committee from Michigan, um, has been a great champion for our industry. She has partnered uh, on bipartisan legislation with Bill Cassidy from Louisiana and others uh, to provide resources to employers to provide PPE for all employees. Um, and this would apply throughout the supply chain. Um, a lot of the focus has been specifically on farm workers, but as you all know, we recognize the needs of everyone throughout the supply chain. And so that's something that we have focused on. Um, resources would be provided through grants and loans um, to comply with both federal, state, and local requirements. Um, and that applies to everything from workplace standards to housing and transportation. As many of you know, um, there have been efforts to uh, change some of the standards at the state and local level, how it regards to transportation and housing of workers. And so this uh, attempts to uh, deal with those challenges, uh, not only the ones that have been enacted, uh, but those that may be forthcoming. In addition to that, uh, United Fresh has been working with a bipartisan group of House members uh, led by Darren LaHood from Illinois and again our friend Jimmy Panetta from California uh, to provide resources to businesses that have delivered fresh produce but have not been paid since the start of the COVID-19 Act. And this is done through the PLUS Act. Um, many folks have been able to uh, be required to deliver product uh, to different businesses, but have not been paid. And the goal of this legislation is to make sure that we can provide resources to those businesses that have provided that, those resources in good faith, but have not been paid. So those are the first two of uh, some of the bills that we're supporting. Why don't we move on to the next? 
Um, the next one is the Frontline Act, uh, the FRNT Act, which was introduced by Senator Joni Ernst from Iowa. Um, she's been particularly focused on this issue and it provides essential workers a suspension of federal income and payroll taxes up to an annual income of $50,000 annually. And additional resources would be provided to comply with federal and state and local requirements. So this is again trying to tackle some of the challenges that have come up during the COVID process, uh, but to make sure that we can keep those essential workers in place and keep our essential food industry businesses operating. The probably the biggest issue um, and that has, has faced, uh, I think, businesses of all kinds, but particularly the produce industry, is the issue of liability protection. Um, this is something that I'm sure that everybody on the phone has dealt with in some form or fashion. And it has been identified as the number one priority by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. To that end, uh, Senator McConnell worked with Senator Cornyn of Texas uh, to introduce the Safe to Work Act, as you can see, S4317. Um, but there was also an effort, a bicameral effort, uh, that was led by Senate, or excuse me, Representative Garrett Graves and Representative Henry Cuellar uh, of Texas um, and the Get America Back to Work Act. The goal is to provide protection for employers uh, who have followed the law. Uh, have followed the recommendations from the CDC and followed both local, state, uh, and other federal recommendations uh, to take care of their workers. Uh, but as we all know that in a litigious society, um, that this is an issue that is something that we need to keep an eye on. Um, and we do expect that there will be some kind of bicameral compromise uh, between these two bills that will be included in either a COVID-4 package uh, or something within the, uh, it's the continuing resolution to fund the government. I can't stress this issue enough, um, is that when Robert talks about telling the, the stories that you are dealing with uh, as business owners um, and talking about the positive things that you have done to protect your workers, this is one of those issues that needs to be addressed. Um, but making sure that you have legal protection, if you have done the good thing, you have done the right thing to comply with the law and the regulations, um, that you also need that legal liability protection. So with that, Robert, I will turn it back to you. Thanks, John. Uh, that was great. Uh, Molly, um, why don't you talk about some of the uh, supply chain issues through nutrition programs? Sure. Thanks, Robert. And Good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Uh, and I'm going to try to move through this quickly, but if you have questions about anything that was discussed today, you can drop them in the comments and we will um, address them when I'm done. Uh, so in terms of supply chain su support through nutrition programs, it really falls into three umbrellas in terms of what we'll be asking for at Washington Conference. The first is farmers to families, uh, second is schools, and then support for the retail environment. Next. So Farmers and Families, I know people are generally familiar with this, but just to kind of summarize again, kind of where we are today, um, more than 75 million boxes have been delivered since May. Um, $1.7 billion of those have been for fresh produce um, that was distributed through contracts with about 200 produce distributors. Um, USDA has indicated that the funding for this will um, sunset the end of October. That's not to say in round three the deliveries will go beyond October 31st, but the contracts will be shored up and distributed by the end of October. Um, current contractors just on Friday were extended through September 18th, um, and that was to give USDA more time to do um, to review the basic ordering agreements, which is how USDA is conducting farmers to families for round three. And that round three through the BOAs, um, there's been an additional $1 billion allocated for that, um, that third round. 
So just kind of a reminder and to, to put this in context as we're going into Washington Conference and asking and really fighting for this program to continue both um, with our advocacy with the USDA and on the Hill. Um, the program was designed to do two things, address the economic impact of food service closures, restaurants, um, hospitality and schools, and then also help with the increased demand that food banks were facing um, and some of the challenges that they were having meeting those due to social distancing and other just kind of changes in distribution due to COVID. Um, and neither of those will be fully addressed. You know, there's pockets where people are returning or some things have gotten better, but overall we still see a ton of need at food banks. And of course, as you all know, um, the restaurant food service in schools just has not come back to the level it was before COVID. Um, so the need is absolutely still there. So we want to make sure to convey that, that this problem hasn't gone away. So the program can't go away either. So our ask is relatively simple and straightforward that Congress and USD must maintain and enhance this program through COVID stimulus legis legislation. And we can have and we'll have um, workshops and discussions about this. Um, as Robert mentioned, there's been some controversies. There's definitely ways in which it can be improved and enhanced. It hasn't helped everybody. Um, there is more good to it than not. So we need to make sure it continues. So we'll have some really robust conversations about that um, at the Washington Conference. So schools, um, just to kind of do a quick overview of what they mean to the supply chain. Um, every day, 42 million breakfasts and lunches are served, and each of those have fruit and vegetable requirements to it them. And within um, the last decade, has doubled the, the amount of fruits and vegetables that are offered through school meals. And they're a huge buyer um, of fresh produce in this country. Uh, USA recently a waiver just this week, um, it received some news. If you have school business, I'm sure you're aware of this, that they will extend the waivers that they issued in the spring that allowed schools to serve free meals to all kids under 18. And that there's, um, we could have a whole separate webinar on that, but there are a lot of challenges um, with uh, virtual schooling right now and grab and go and how you verify children's eligibility. Um, so allowing that waiver um, was a really big deal and that extends through December 31st, uh, 31st of this year. So our ask, um, our two main ask for schools is twofold. So uh, extending that universal free meals through the end of the school year to make sure that we maintain kind of supply chain um, stability through schools and then also make sure kids are fed because we know that there's more kids who are food insecure now than um, than it was a year ago and when the school the schools that had opened up this school year that before USDA extended the waiver were reporting up to 90% decrease in participation which is was not reflective of the need so we just need to make sure that schools and the supply chain and this doesn't just affect the fresh produce has that stability so we're gonna ask for co-sponsorship and inclusion of the Pandemic Child Hunger Prevention Act that was introduced by um, Education and Labor Chairman Bobby Scott um, to be included in a COVID stimulus package. And then the second bill, I um, mean, this was included in the HEROES Act that uh, passed the House earlier. It would allow the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, which is really a signature program for us that provides fresh fruit and vegetable snacks to kids to be able to be served regardless of whether parents are picking it up to take home. We saw some of those challenges with the logistics of that in the spring. So we just want to make sure that that continues. Um, and there is a standalone bill, Produce for Kids Act, um, introduced by Josh Harder and Jeff Andrew. So in terms of retail, um, what are asks are here related to nutrition is around WIC. So right now, um, mothers and children under five that are enrolled in WIC are eligible for, the children are eligible for $9 a month for fruits and vegetable purchases and the women are eligible for 11. Know that that's not adequate for nutrition purposes. It doesn't align with science, the dietary guidelines, um, and it's just it's just inadequate. And WIC is a really successful program, and retailers 
already run it. And it's a really great way to keep fresh produce moving through the supply chain in a way that's not a brand new program and just kind of increases the purchasing capacity in a system that already exists. Um, and then the other program that we'll be focusing on is Pandemic EBT, which was passed in the first COVID package way back in the spring. And for schools that are closed for in-school instruction, and every single state has decided to offer this now, it was totally up to the states. Um, kids that were eligible for free or reduced price lunch could get um, an EBT, essentially SNAP benefits that worth the value of the school meals to purchase um, food at SNAP authorized retailers. So our two asks around here is to increase the WIC benefit from the nine and $11 to $35 a month for the duration of the pandemic. And that was um, a standalone bill, again, introduced by Kim Schreier um, from Washington and Rhonda White from Texas. And that this one too was included in HEROES. So we'd like to see this included in um, the final COVID bill. And also you know, to get co-sponsorship for that in the house, we'll just show that there's support for it. And the second one, this just happened um, on Friday, they introduced but it would add very similar to the WIC benefit. So again, WIC is just for kids up to age five. So you're missing all of those students. Um, once they age out of that, that are not in school right now, it would increase, uh, it would add a $35 a month vegetable benefit that looks very much like WIC to their SNAP benefits. Um, and that bill was just introduced by, again, Kim Stryer um, and Jamie Herrera Butler from both in Washington about that because it's bipartisan well great thank you very much molly um that's a great overview both you and john of, of some of the issues before we kind of get into some questions and discussion uh, again if you have any questions for any of us please uh write them in the, the q a uh section of your uh, of your of your screen uh that would be um that'd be helpful uh, but I have a few questions. So John Holly, uh, if you can unmute yourself uh, and Molly, I guess as well for the time being. So John, uh, one of the things we didn't touch on in, in the slides, but there's been a, a lot of work done is on the worker safety, uh, immigration, uh, workforce availability um, uh, side of, of our industry. A lot of work being done at the administrative level to keep you know, HUA workers here, but also the importance of help, uh, work, workforce health, or workforce safety, excuse me. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that space as well, uh, of what we've been doing and, and what might be part of the, the discussions in September? Yeah, Robert, uh, uh, glad that you brought that up. Um, really from the beginning of the pandemic, um, we recognized that the H2A program, which is so vital to so many in our industry, um, must be maintained. Um, and when we saw that a number of restrictions were being put on uh, international travel, we worked with the Trump administration to protect uh, most of the workers that are coming into the country um, and making sure that uh, our consulates and embassies could stay open to process the H-2A visas and H-2B visas, which are so vital to our industry. We've been successful in that and in keeping that going. Um, we've also been successful at working with them to re uh, relax some of the restrictions about uh, workers moving between employers and the length of time that they are allowed to stay within the country. Um, so that is something that we are definitely uh, keeping an eye on um, and have had good conversations both with Congress and the administration on maintaining um, those standards. Uh, the second part of it is, uh, as many of you know, uh, through the H-2A program, you are required to provide uh, housing and transportation for employees. Um, and that comes at uh, quite a cost to a lot of the folks that are on this call and, and throughout our industry. Um, and the way that different localities and states have dealt with this issue has become more concerning over time as different standards are set up. Set up. So that's something that we're continuing to monitor as well. Um, and you know, we've talked to uh, members of Congress and the administration about that. 
to make sure that it doesn't become prohibitive uh, to employ such workers. Great, thanks, John. Molly, I'm, I'm staring at this um, policy ask and uh, related to WIC and SNAP, and that seems like such a big jump from what currently the 35 or um, I guess you could say $70 a month of new benefits related to fruit and vegetables. How does that work with the budget? Uh, how does that work, um, you know, kind of from a, from a recipient standpoint of, the, of, those, of those benefits? Yeah, so those are good questions. So for WIC, the, the first one, um, we actually were able to use funding that, so WIC is kind of pre-funded every year, um, and there was enough funding. They have about $500 million this year that's still unspent. And then we determined that based on the participation of women and children age two to five, obviously like newborns and infants don't get fruit and vegetable voucher, um, but there was enough money to cover it. So there's actually no new spending for the first, uh, for, to increase it up to $35 and it's a state option. So states decide that for whatever reason, I don't know why they would, that they only want to do $20. Um, it can do that, but there is existing funding for that. And the level that we picked is 35 because the National Academy of Sciences, which is the research institution that puts forth recommendations on what the food package should look like in 2017 said that um, kids should be getting $35 a month worth of fruits and vegetables in order to align with the dietary guidelines. So it's science-based and it's also um, already funded through existing WIC money. And if that WIC money's not spent, it just goes back and wherever unspent federal money goes. Um, and then for the second one, for the PEBT, um, that is SNAP mandatory funding. Um, so that we, we didn't need a separate authorization for that, um, but it is um, mandatory funding. Uh, and the number of kids enrolled in it isn't a huge amount, but it's certainly um, significant for those that are participating and would be significant for, um, for retailers too that, that are accepting it. Um, so that's kind of where we got those. So no new budget increase for these two to ask. And so uh, money's already there that could supplement these if, if, if they get into the final package. That's correct, yes. Great. And they're both Great. temporary for now. Right, good point. Yeah. So question for both of you. Uh, when I, we kind of go through all these different bills and programs that we're, we're asking them to include, most of them, if not all, are, are bipartisan. Talk about the importance in this current environment of, of having both Democrat and Republican support for these initiatives that we're, we're focusing on in terms of getting them uh, in, you know, across the finish line, so to speak, uh, in a final, final package. John, you want to start and then Molly can add to that? Yeah, so um, really great question uh, given the current environment that we're in. Um, despite what uh, what the news might tell you each night, um, there is still a lot of bipartisan work that's going on in Congress. And with a Republican Senate and a Democratic House, it's really imperative uh, to have bipartisan efforts on the issues that we are focused on. Uh, because the House, as Robert has mentioned before, has already passed the HEROES Act. The Senate has introduced their own legislation. And many of you may have read about the debate that's going on about the administration's position and, and how do they negotiate out uh, the, the two houses of Congress's uh, efforts here. Um, so by having bipartisan efforts in both the House and Senate, we feel that we can raise our issues to the top of the list of issues that could be included in what they call a skinny uh, COVID-19 or a COVID-19 package. Um, and so I think that that certainly behooves our efforts and uh, in the long run will do a great deal to uh, bring some more benefits to the fresh produce industry. Yeah, just to kind of follow up on that, when you look specifically at the two bills that are um, on the screen, uh, 
were one that was shared previously were included in Heroes Act, which most would not consider a bipartisan effort. It was a democratically driven bill that had kind of everything anybody wanted on the Democrat side for the most part. Um, so when it gets to the Senate, it has to be negotiated in a bipartisan manner because of their structure. Um, the fact that these standalone bills had bipartisan support makes them much more compelling when it gets into those negotiations. It makes it much harder for Republicans on the Senate side to say, well, we can't do that because there's not consensus around it. We've already established the consensus. So it positions us well going into those negotiations. Great, great, great answers and great, um, uh, you know, kind of enlightenment, so to speak, to the folks here on the phone about why we spend so much time uh, focusing on bipartisan support because of, you know, like you said, Molly, and, and John as well, but Molly, you know, the only reason a couple of these bills are already in the, the, the House version of, of COVID-4 stimulus is because they had bipartisan support. And we've got to continue that. So those meetings that we focus on in, in a couple of weeks, you know, getting more and more sponsors on these bills will be important to, to our efforts. So um, before we get into any more questions and discussion from you guys, and again, if you have any questions, please type them in. Um, kind of what can you do right now? Uh, register yourself um, uh, and your team. Uh, if you haven't registered already, already. Uh, this gets you access to participating in the, the virtual meetings on Capitol Hill. Uh, also, all the great education that we, we have. And also, even, you know, I'll, I'll again mention the fact that, uh, um, that um, you uh, will get uh, access to our market segment and, and council meetings on Monday. Uh, it gives you unique insight into some of the meetings, what we're talking about again, what is going to be important, not just at the moment, but into, into the remainder of this year. So some good information that as a registrant, you, you will have access to over, over those, those several days. Um, obviously, again, as I mentioned, sign up for the congressional visits. It's gonna be important for us to get an accurate count of who's coming or who's participating in each of these meetings so we can start providing that information to the meetings we already have scheduled with, with members' offices. Uh, so make sure you do that uh, um, after you register. Uh, and then finally, uh, talk to your peers uh, in the industry. Uh, this is an important time. This is our, one of our last chances to really continue to expand some of that support we have on the COVID-related initiatives that we've been focusing on since March of this year. Uh, there's a lot of other important things that we would like to be focusing on uh, that we uh, have been focusing on as well. Um, but really, this is taking up, as you could well expect, a lot of the uh, legislative administration's time since March of this year and will continue to do so for the remainder of this year. And I think lastly, uh, talk about, you know, talk about the importance of this election. And you're not going to get anywhere else, you know, kind of the most up-to-date insight on how the congressional elections could, could turn out, how the presidential elections could turn out. Uh, we will be you know, right in the crux of that, you know, maybe, I guess, you know, seven, eight weeks out from the, from the, from the elections. So we're going to have top level, you know, people from each, each, each uh, campaign, as well as a uh, broad insight into some of the congressional stuff as well. So a great opportunity as well there. So with that, I uh, want to do some questions and discussions. Uh, one of the things that has come up in the past is especially about the virtual meetings, just so we're clear here, um, about is there gonna be a limit on how many people can participate in meetings? And I think that's really uh, something that at this time, we have not been put, had any limits put on us for a certain amount of people. If we do, we will let you know. Uh, we'll make sure that is made clear uh, as you sign up. If, if there's been a limit put on us, a cap, so to speak, on how many people could sign up for a meeting. Uh, but at this, as of today, we have not uh, experienced that. So we've been very pleased that members have been very open, not just to meet with their constituents, but also allow other people from across the country to participate in these meetings. So that's been a really good, um, um, really good part of the, of the, um, 
of, of the process of doing these virtual meetings as, as well. Um, and I see now we're right at our three o'clock level, uh, three o'clock uh, time. And so I don't want to keep you any longer. Uh, but again, we want to thank you for today. Uh, as a reminder, uh, please sign up and register. Uh, all of these sessions now will be uh, be able to be downloaded and, and please share them with, with your friends and colleagues to get them interested in coming. Uh, John and Molly, thank you for your insight and your, your depth of knowledge on these issues. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, to, to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Uh, thank you and have a great rest of your day.